Well, I hope everyone was able to weather the storm that we had over the last couple of days as Hurricane Debbie moved into the southeastern part of the United States and moved on up the coast and through North Carolina. And I don't know how much rain we got, but it was a lot of rain. That storm stayed out on the ocean for a long time. It was a slow moving storm, which means that it had a lot of moisture in it. And so it dumped a lot of rain as it moved on up into the Northeast. So, so we hope that you were able to to weather that storm and, and didn't have any, any real problems or any damage. I'm also reminded of the fact that it's just been a few weeks ago that we were complaining about what a dry summer we were having. And that storm and all the rain is just a reminder that we're not in charge, that God certainly is. Our lesson today is, is an interesting lesson. It's our second week of discussing celebration. And it's a lesson that I must admit I really had not reflected on much, but there's so much here. And, and it's a lesson, it's out of Leviticus, it's out of Deuteronomy, and it's titled Holy Feasting Divine Presence. The purpose statement of the lesson is to consider how sacred feasting can celebrate God's presence with us. To consider how sacred feasting, and I, I guess I hadn't reflected on that a lot. I hadn't reflected on, on meal time and, and how important that is. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Now I'm also going to add a passage, I'm going to add a passage from 2 Corinthians because I immediately thought about that when I started reading the two passages that were the focal passage. And it comes from 2 Corinthians 9, 5 through 15. And it's a passage that we'd actually done a, a campaign back at a church that, that we were members of back a long time ago now in, in Wilmington, North Carolina. And we used this passage and it's resonated with me ever since. Let's say it comes from 2 Corinthians 9 and 5 through 15. This is why I thought it was necessary to encourage the brothers to go to you ahead of time and arrange in advance the generous gift you have already promised. I want it to be a real gift from you. I don't want you to feel like you are being forced to give anything. What I mean is this. The one who sows a small number of seeds will also reap a small crop. And the one who sows a generous amount of seeds will also reap a generous crop. Everyone should give whatever they have decided in their heart. They shouldn't give with hesitation or because of pressure. God loves a cheerful giver. God has the power to provide you with more than enough of every kind of grace. That way you will have everything you need always and everything to provide more than enough for every kind of good work. As it is written, he scattered everywhere he gave to the needy, his righteousness remains forever. The one who supplies seed for planting and bread for eating will supply and multiply your seed and will increase your crop, which is righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous in every way. Such generosity produces thanksgiving to God through us. Your ministry of this service to God's people isn't only fully meeting their needs, but is also multiplying in many expressions of thanksgiving to God. They will give honor to God for your obedience to your confession of Christ's gospel. They will do this because this service provides evidence of your obedience and because of your generosity in serving with them and with everyone. They will also pray for you and they will care deeply for you because of the outstanding grace that God has given to you. Thank God for his gift that words can't describe. I love that passage. As I say, we had a campaign and, and the campaign was built around the fact of celebrating the gift. Celebrating the gift, the gifts that God has given us. And I love that passage, God loves a cheerful giver. Now our, our lesson today, as I say, it comes from Leviticus and Deuteronomy, which are words from Moses to the people of Israel. And they were certainly written thousands of years before Paul sent this letter to the church in Corinth. But let's talk about being a happy giver. A, a giver that's glad. Are you a cheerful giver? It says God loves a cheerful giver. Are you? I mean, ask yourself that. Do you give your time freely? Would you give your last bread to someone who needs it? I mean, one of the things, my friends, of faith that we always must recognize is what it, our action is when we give. God calls us to give of ourselves, our time, our resources. Yet there's so many people who we see that don't want to give. It's much easier to spend money on ourselves than to give to someone else. All our abilities and talents we receive from God. 
and we're to use all of those abilities, all those talents, for His glory. And how did we get where we are if we didn't have those abilities? It all belongs to God. And sometimes we have to be reminded of that. We must train and improve our abilities so that we can reach the highest possible standard and influence others to follow Him. We need to do all the good we can, by all the means we can, in all the ways we can, at all times, and to all the people, for as long as we can. Luke 12, 48 says, Unto whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required. Sometimes we think about that. We, we don't reflect on the fact that these wonderful gifts that we've been given by God, and yet we're to share those gifts, whatever they are. If we seek to do His will and desire His approval of our giving and earn our riches in heaven, then we will reach out to those in need. God implanted in every believer a desire to give. I've mentioned before, there's, there's a, a charity, Bright Blessings, and the charity was set up years ago here in the, the Charlotte area, and it was set up to have a birthday at school for children that otherwise wouldn't be able to have a birthday, that their parents didn't, didn't provide a birthday for them, and yet they wanted to be able to honor that child on their birthday. And what's interesting about that is that they started the program, they were doing the program, and yet what they found out was the child who they were giving the birthday for wanted to give something back to the other children that were celebrating their birthday. And so they started bringing party favors to give out. Now think about that a second. Watch a child's birthday party. Go to any child's birthday party, I don't care how small they are, how young they are, and you will see that the children there want the, the person that has, is having the birthday to open their present first. We're, we're, we're that way. That, that's the way we were designed. That's the way God made us. Yet what happens is, and I've used this expression many times before, somebody likes to rent off our candy, and all of a sudden we don't want to give anymore. Our lesson focuses on giving and giving generously. So I'm going to go ahead and read the two passages. Uh, as I say, the first is from Leviticus, and then the second will be from Deuteronomy. From Leviticus 19, 23 we read, When you enter the land and plant any fruit tree, you must consider its fruit off limits. For three years it will be off limits to you. It must not be eaten. In the fourth year, all of the tree's fruit will be holy, a celebration for the Lord. In the fifth year, you can eat the fruit. This is so as to increase its produce for you. I am the Lord your God. And then from Deuteronomy, and this is Moses' instructions to the people of Israel and his final instructions. We read, you must reserve a tenth part of whatever your fields produce each year. Eat the tenth part of your grain, wine, oil, oldest offspring of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God in the location he selects for his name to reside so that you learn to fear the Lord your God at all times. But if the trip is too long because of the location the Lord your God has selected to put his name is far away from where you live so that you can't transport the tenth part because the Lord your God will certainly bless you then you can convert it to money. Take the money with you and go to the location the Lord your God selects. Then you can use the money for anything you want, cattle, sheep, wine, beer, or whatever else you might like. Then you should feast there and celebrate in the presence of the Lord your God, along with your entire household. Only make sure not to neglect the Levites who are living in your cities because they don't have a designated inheritance like you do. Every third year you must bring the tenth part of your produce from that year and leave it at your city gates. Then the Levites, who have no designated inheritance like you, along with the other immigrants, orphans, and widows who live in your cities, will come and feast until they are full. Do this so that the Lord your God might bless you in everything you do. So, so what's that passage telling us? That passage is telling us to, that we need to give a tenth of whatever we produce. We need to give it back to the Lord. We need to give it back for His ministry. And so what are we talking about here? Well, obviously, and anybody that's ever been to church knows that 10%, we start talking about tithing. A tithe is a percentage that we can freely give to carry on God's work. Offerings are not to be confused with tithes. Offerings are amounts given above the tithes. 
Now, Paul had this same problem with the church in Corinth. And he wanted them to be cheerful givers. And I read that passage too. He wanted us to give generously. He, he wanted to encourage to give generously, but he wanted us to give generously and feel good about giving. Generous givers prepare ahead of time. And if you think about it, if, if you know people and you, you see people that are, are very generous with what they have, whether it's their time or their, or their financial resources, whatever it is, they've prepared ahead of time to give. And when we plan, it puts us in a frame of mind which makes us willing, ready, and able to give. That's no matter what it is, whether that's money, whether that's resources, whether it's sharing something with somebody, we plan ahead. If we're going to, to participate in a, in a, a program, a, a project, we plan ahead, we allocate that time. We say, I've got to clear the, clear the decks, I've got to prepare a time to do that. And then what wonderful things we can do. I think one of the greatest things that we do as a church at, at Mount Zion is our fall barbecue. That's been going on for decades. And the preparation, the planning goes into that is months ahead of time. But once, when you plan, you do it, and at the end of the day, at the end of the barbecue, you can sit back and yes, you're tired. But you, you have this sense of we've done something. We've done something once again, and we've shared with other people. I think it's also important to know that generous givers are imitators of God. We cannot outgive God. God gave us everything. God gave us Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died on the cross for us, for each and every one of us. You can't give more than that. Generous givers trust God. The important thing is not how much we give, it's the decision. It's the fact that we do it, we make a decision what to give and we give it. We give it cheerfully. It's a step of faith. It's a step of faith knowing that even though we give, and at the time we think maybe we shouldn't, God will supply all our needs. And it's also true, and, and my friends, I can assure you this is true, generous givers always receive more. What you sow, you will reap. It's like a harvest. It's like a harvest that, that when, we, when we sow and we, we plant and we plan, we're going to have a wonderful gift that we can share with somebody else. And when we do that, we grow and we, come, we become more Christ-like when we give. Tithing does one thing that's important to understand. It proves God's word is true. Put God to the test. Try it. Give your 10%. Give your tithe, and you will be blessed. Tithing teaches us to put God first. Everything is given to us by God, so we need to give it back. Tithing is essential to our spiritual growth. How can God trust you with more if you don't share what you've already got? And it's also important to understand as we think about tithing, we think about bringing our 10%, that it's part of worship that we offer to God. As we fulfill God's will, He fills our lives with blessings from His hand. And Christians, as people of faith, we should willingly give and give it with thanksgiving. Give willingly, willingly and joyfully. Because remember, God loves a cheerful giver. And we're honoring him each time that we give. Now our lesson writer spent some time and, and focused specifically on feasting, on meals. And, and, I, and I've been thinking about that, but it's, it's so true. It just makes so much sense. But like so many things, we don't think about it. And I've never really focused on how important meals are. And yet when we look at Scripture, we look at, at, at Scripture, we start thinking about it, we go, of course they're important. They were important to Jesus. I mean, consider what happens when we share a meal. Somebody produced the food. Somebody grew it. Somebody sowed a seed planted a crop or, or, or raised uh, a chicken or raised cattle or whatever. Somebody took the time to do that. And then once the food was delivered, once you had the food, someone had to take time to prepare it. It was a skill to do that. I can fix a meal, but I can't fix a meal as good as my wife Judy. Someone took the time to prepare it. And then we like to have other people come when we go to have a meal. Because what do we do? We create memories when we do that. Think of your own dining room table. 
And, and I will admit that it, it, today, in our day and time, people have cell phones. When I go to a restaurant and I see people on their cell phones, instead of just enjoying the meal and enjoying each other's company, it does bother me. But I can remember growing up, and it was one of the most special times of the day. I mean, we knew that there was going to be a specific time that we were going to have our meals. And we sat there at the table. We paid attention to each other. We always started out with a blessing. We prayed over our meal. We prayed for the fact that we were together, that we were able to share in this meal. We prayed for, for my mother, who prepared the meal. And we gave thanks for that. But think of what all happened around that dining room table. Think about all the, the discussions you had, the dramas that were played out, just the chats as a family, sharing news, sharing what you did during the day, telling stories, maybe laughing, poking fun at each other. We, we made friendships. We welcomed other people into our home. Sunday afternoon was a, was a time when my grandparents came. What a blessing that was because it was all around love. It was around love and this meal we were sharing. We love the dining room table. We love to be able to sit around and think about your past. Think about the people that were at the dining room table that aren't there anymore. But think about how they influenced your life. How did Jesus use his meals? Think about that a second. They were such teaching moments. In Luke 7, he's eating at one of the Pharisees' house. And a woman who was a well-known sinner came and brought a jar of ointment to wash his feet. They were disgusted that an unclean woman had done it. He then used that as a teaching moment about forgiveness and forgave the woman of her sins. In Luke 10, 38 and 42, he's eating with Mary and Martha, and Martha gets cross because she's busy and Mary's not helping. And you'll remember that story. And Jesus uses it as a teaching moment about making good choices about how to use your time. In Luke 24, 30, after the resurrected, Jesus had walked on the Emmaus Road. Their eyes were opened as they broke bread together. And those are just three examples. Think about all the times that Jesus used a meal. Consider the fact that when we share a meal, when we share a meal with somebody else, it's a missional meal. It's an opportunity to share our love with somebody else. I mean, we're told that, that Jesus ate with tax collectors and with sinners. And so how does that apply with, to us when we think about it? Think about there's two terms that we think about. There's entertaining and there's hospitality. Entertaining is when we get out our, our best china, we, we, we plan a party, we invite people, and, and we hope that they invite us the next time they have a party. But what Jesus did, he expressed hospitality. He, he, he welcomed people. He welcomed strangers. And, and I think about the opportunity, I think about with me, and, and it, it's, it's been an interesting thing. I mentioned last week, week before, about the, the Men of Mercy House in Wilmington, and about having a meal with them, having our Sunday school class have a meal with them. And, and how special that was. And it gave us an opportunity, it gave us an opportunity to pray with them. It gave us an opportunity to hear about their lives. You can do the same thing, I've done it before. I'm, I've had people that have said they're hungry and if there's a McDonald's close by, I'll say, well, come with me and I'll buy something for them. And I'll sit down there with them for a few minutes, I'll ask them their name and then we'll, we'll share a, a cheeseburger. It's important to do that. It's important for people to know that they're loved. You never know what door you're going to open. There's nothing wrong with entertaining. I love entertaining. It's a wonderful thing. But hospitality can take it to the next level in terms of our relationship with other people because it's all about loving people. It's sharing God's love. Think about that. Think about a way that you can show hospitality to somebody. I heard about some high school kids, high school young men. I think it was a sports team. And they actually took food on the street. Their coach said, we're going to take food, we're going to deliver it on the street. And, and we're, going to, we're going to meet some of these homeless people. We're going to, going to give them a sandwich. And we're going to share that with them. We're going to tell them God loves them. And we're going to hear what their story is. There's so many ways. Meals are so important. To, to bake, to, to take something to somebody. Maybe it's a person that's shut in. Just take a sandwich. Take a, take a, if you're a good baker, take, maybe take a piece of pie. Or take a piece of cake and share that with somebody else, knowing that you're loving them and they're going to know from you that God loves them also.
Will you pray with me, my friends? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks for this message. We give you thanks for this lesson today. It's so important. It's so important, yet sometimes we forget. Sometimes we get busy. Sometimes we, we, we forget the little things that we can do. You have taught us. You put it in our hearts from a very early age to be cheerful givers. And we need to do that. When we give, we need to plan to give, and we know that. And we just ask that as we go throughout this week that you keep our eyes open to those things you want us to see, those opportunities, our ears open to those things you want us to hear, and our hearts overflowing with that love that you have put in each and every one of us. In his name we pray. Amen. I love you, my friends, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.